message of the new year, and in this message, we often like to try to cast a little vision for the, the month ahead and even for the new year ahead. And so if you're here with us this morning, I'm excited that you chose to be here, that you're able to be here with us this morning. I know many are tuning in from uh, at home this morning as well, watching on the live stream, and some will be catching up uh, with the message series perhaps sometime later in this week as they may be traveling this morning. But this is an important message, and I'm glad that you're here with us to share in it again this morning as we are casting some vision for what is upcoming in this new year. You know, as I think about uh, the new year and just new things in general, it strikes me that, that often we, we like new things, don't we? I mean, that's some of the excitement about what we, we just enjoyed at Christmas time, especially if you're a kid and we've got all kids in here this morning, all our elementary kids. And so uh, welcome kids. Glad that you guys are here with us this morning. How many of you opened something new on Christmas morning that you were excited about? Raise your hands, kids, if that's true. Adults, you can raise your hand, too, if you open up something new that you were excited about this Christmas morning, right? And that you that you liked and probably you thanked the person that you received that gift from, you sent Santa a letter, whatever you had to do to describe the fact that you were excited about that new thing. We like new things. And it strikes me that much of what we enjoy in our world today was new at some point in time, right? So we're going to play a little game this morning. We're going to play a game called, What Year Was the Blank Invented? Because all things were new at some point in time. We're going to have a little fun with this. So... The first question I want to ask you, and you guys are going to guess, join me in this, have a little fun. Kids, I want you to participate in this as well. The first question I'm going to ask is this, what year was the light bulb invented? Okay, and, and I want you to take a guess, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and share your guess with them. All right, so share your guess with them, and if you're within 10 years of having this right, you win. So what year was the light bulb invented? The year the light bulb was invented in 1879. How many of you were within 10 years of the year that the light bulb was invented? Good for you guys. We got some history buffs in here. So you want to listen to those people next to you because they know the answer, right? All right, how about this one? What year was the automobile invented? For all you kids, that's a car, right? So what year was the car invented, the automobile invented? What do you think? What do you think? Within 10 years on this one, we'll work for this one too. All right, the car was invented in 1886, so how many of you were within 10 years on that one? Pretty good. I see some themes emerging. Some of you guys know this stuff. How about this one? What year was the television invented? Again, if you're within 10 years of this one, we'll give it to you. What do you think? All right, 1927. The television was invented in 1927. How many of you were within 10 years of that one? All right, and the next three are going to flow kind of in order together. They're all connected. What year do you think the telephone was invented? If you're within 10 years, again, we'll give this one to you. Go ahead and whisper to your neighbor what year you think the telephone was invented. Man, we're going way back for this one, and this one shocked me. 1876, the telephone was invented. No clue. I would have been way off on that one. How about this one, though? We're getting a little closer to, to slightly more modern history. What year was the cell phone invented? What do you think? 1900? What year was the cell phone invented? And this one I was a little bit surprised about as well. The cell phone was invented in 1973. Whoa, we've had cell phones for a while. All right, now this last one, you got to be within a year, okay? Like I said, these last three connected. What year was the iPhone invented? Or we'll be a little bit more specific. What year was the iPhone released? What year do you think the iPhone was released to the public? What do you think? You got to be within a year. Can you remember Steve Jobs standing there with the big announcement saying, here comes this thing that you've never seen before. And now we're on like what, iPhone 12, 13, somewhere in there? 2007. How many of you got that one? Worth any year? All right. Well, there's no doubt. We, we like new things, right? We enjoy new things and we like to celebrate new things as they come about, whether it be Christmas gifts or new inventions. We love to celebrate these kind of things. We love to celebrate new years as we ring them in. So I got another question for you. And this one's especially for the kids. How many of you kids stayed up all the way 
to midnight on New Year's Eve. How many of you kids? Man, that's a lot of you kids. I have a feeling more kids stayed up to New Year's Eve than did adults. How many of you adults did not stay up to midnight? Be honest. Me too. I was in bed. I know, I'm lame. But we do. We celebrate. We celebrate new things. We celebrate the new year. And, and certainly throughout this country, there were loads of New Year's parties celebrating a new year, 2022. And here at Grace Chapel, we also celebrate New Year's. We just do it a little bit differently than sometimes the world celebrates it. And what we do is we actually celebrate the new year by dedicating it to God, by devoting this new year, this coming year to God. We did this last year as well. We're going to do it again this year by celebrating and dedicating this coming year to God in 21 days of prayer and fasting, beginning next Sunday and going to Saturday, January the 29th. I know that looks like 20 days, but if you count it on your fingers, I promise it will be 21 days of prayer and fasting that we will celebrate together here at Grace Chapel as we look for God to do amazing things among us as we dedicate this year to Him. That's the way we're going to celebrate this coming year. Now, last year as we did this, I had a message series that shared some of the importance of, of fasting with you all as a church. And if you missed that message series, you can go back on our website and review that message series. We're not going to go all the way through that series again together this month. Certainly we can't do that today, but I do want to point out to you several reasons that fasting, that choosing to fast, spiritual fasting, as we give something up so that we can embrace something else, is truly a blessing and can truly help shape us and set a tone for what is to come. Now, often we view, we view fasting as a burden. I talked to, uh, last year about the fact that, you know, sometimes when I go to the doctor's office and I go there for a routine checkup and they say, we're going to need to do some extra blood work, something came back in the labs, and we're going to need you to not eat before you come in and take this test or before you have this next blood work done, I often try to schedule that appointment as early in the morning as I possibly can because I don't want to wait a whole long time to eat. And certainly that can be true medically, but let me tell you this. I've, I've come to look forward to the times where I dedicate a season to spiritual fasting, to fasting to seek God, to come closer to Him, to allow Him to draw closer to me, to erase some of those barriers that sometimes exist, to remove some of the busyness, to have this dedicated, focused time where I am chasing after God, where I am seeking Him, where I'm leaning into the promise that if we ask, seek, and knock, we're going to find Him. He's going to open the door. The answer will be given to us. And so we lean into that. So I shared last year several reasons that spiritual fasting is a blessing. And I just want to share a few of those with you again this morning as we kind of as we dig a little bit deeper into this message. So some reasons to view spiritual fasting as a blessing as opposed to a burden is that often when we fast, we're pursuing a deeper friendship with God. I already talked about that just a little bit. We can see that in Psalm 42 as the psalmist says, as the deer thirst or pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And as we fast, we express that. And we find often that deeper friendship with God. But also we find often that what it does is it renews within us a hunger for heavenly things. We often hunger for the things of this world and it's not until we start to give those things up, set them aside and pursue God, pursue those heavenly things, that our hunger for the heavenly things is renewed. What you feed yourself is often what you're hungry for. And what you hunger for is what you often feed yourself. And so if we feed ourselves with the things of God, what often happens is we hunger even more for those things of God. Fasting is also great training, great soul training for self-denial, which is what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. We're called to deny ourselves, and Mark says to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. Luke actually says to deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily, every day, so that we can follow him. And often fasting helps us Take that next step in self-denial. Again, as we're saying no to one thing to say yes to something else, fasting helps us there. In Luke 4, we have this beautiful example of Jesus actually being led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time of 40 days. And we're only going for 21 ourselves. But Jesus went into the desert and fasted for 40 days. 
But in that time, as he gave up one thing, he found intimacy, security, and strength, especially as he concludes those 40 days by having this kind of showdown with Satan himself, and he quotes Scripture to God, or quotes Scripture to Satan, saying, I'm going to quote you the words of God. And these words are powerful. They express the intimacy, security, and strength that I only find in God and can't find anywhere else. Well, oftentimes, too, as we fast, we remove some of the barriers that exist for us to hear from God as well. And so we have clarity in our prayers. We see that in Daniel 10. There's this beautiful story. I can't share all of it with you now. I would encourage you to go read it. But Daniel was at this place where he was able to engage with God, but there were these barriers between him and God. And so Daniel devotes this time to prayer and seeking out God. Fasting also often brings about humility for revival as we're reminded that the things we need most come from God. That all the blessings that we have come from God, but the things we need most in this life come from God. And as we realize that we can't create those things ourselves, produce them ourselves, earn them ourselves, we realize that God is the source of those things. And it moves us to this place where we realize I can no longer be self-sufficient or self-reliant. I need God for these things that are most important in life. And the last one is this. It often as well gives us these freedom, this freedom from strongholds of the enemy. And oftentimes I think we don't realize how much we truly need that. There's this beautiful, uh, just beautiful passage from 2 Thessalonians Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5, where Paul is saying, look, I want the message to spread, but I'm also asking that God would do what only he can do as he comes in and protects us from those who would do us harm. Well, as we're out on mission for God, there's no doubt that there will be times when there will be some who oppose us and we need freedom from those strongholds of the enemy. And often fasting will help break one of those strongholds. And so we concluded last year, and this this was actually the second message of a series called Awakening, is that disciples of Jesus view fasting as a blessing because they see beyond the physical sacrifice to the spiritual gain. As I said already this morning, I'm at this place in life where I look forward to these times where I will be spiritually fasting, not because I love the physical sacrifice. I don't. I like me some food. I love eating. I like a good meal. I love the holiday season. One of the things I love most about the holiday season is all the food. Probably one of the reasons I most need to fast right now. No, not really. No, we need to fast because we are seeking God spiritually. And we know that as we sacrifice physically, often what happens is God gives us these spiritual insights. This new spiritual reality is revealed to us because we're saying, God, I need you more than this. I need you more than this. Well, this year we're going to have a specific focus in our time of fasting. And there are going to be two scriptures that we're going to be really sinking into. Two scriptures that I want you to be intimately familiar with by the time we conclude this month in our time of prayer and fasting. And I'm going to introduce those to you in just a second. If you received the emails this past, uh, this past few weeks, I've been teasing those just a little bit. And and this morning, we're going to reveal to you what those scriptures are. They are scriptures that I believe will be formative, not just for this month, but for the year ahead. As God is calling us, I believe, to pray two very specific things. Two things that I've been praying, one of them since June, and the other since about September. And I'm going to tell you, they have made a difference in the way I live and the way I see things. They are shaping me, and I think they will you as well. The first comes from this passage in Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, and I'm going to read just a little bit of the context. The verse that we're actually going to focus on is the next verse, but I want you to see the context of this verse. This is what Luke tells us. He says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. So Jesus had his 12 disciples who had been following him. Luke actually shows us the chapter before the sending out of the 12, and there's probably some time that went by between the sending out of the 12 and sending out of the 72. But now we are at this place where Jesus sends out these 72 apprentices, these 72 disciples who had been following him. He's getting ready to send them out on mission themselves. He sends them out in pairs to go ahead of him to every town and place where he is to go to kind of prepare the way for him. And this is what he tells those disciples as he's sending them out. He says these words. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into His harvest fields. And so as Jesus is sending out the 72, He gives them this prayer that He's wanting them to pray. And He tells them several things in this prayer, and we'll recap these in a minute. But first, He shows them that God is the Lord of the harvest. That there's a trouble not with the harvest, but there's a trouble with the workers at times. There's a plentiful harvest, but we don't have a plenty of workers. And so Jesus tells those that He's sending out, here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Lord of the harvest. I want you to pray to the Lord of the harvest, which is God. I want you to pray to God, therefore, that He would send out workers into His harvest field. The field belongs to God. The harvest belongs to God. He's just waiting for the workers. So that's Luke Luke 10.2, and I'll show you what that prayer looks like in just a bit as we will pray that together wrapping up this message. The second scripture that that I hope really sets the tone for this month and then the year ahead as well comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And we're going to read that together, then I'm going to give you the context on the back end of verse 5 as well. So this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I want you, church in Colossae, or all churches who read this, us as well then, to devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Now here comes the bit that we're going to be praying together. Paul says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Before we go on to the next verse, let's just take a look at these short few verses and unpack just a little bit of what Paul says. Paul says, listen, I want you to devote yourselves to prayer, church. This is what I want you to do. I want you to have these times where you set apart time to go and pray. And here's what I want you to do as you pray. I want you to pray that God would open doors for His message. I want you to pray that. Because God is the one who has the ability to open doors. Revelation 3 talks about that. God opens doors that no one can close or no one can shut. So ask God that He would open doors. Why? For the message. And then Paul says beyond that, pray that we would be able to proclaim it clearly. And then Paul sees his personal responsibility in that. He says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now on the back of that, Paul says these words in Colossians 4, 5. He says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Now here's what I want to tell you. I found is I have been praying Luke 10, Two in Colossians 4.24, as I've been praying these prayers the last several months, praying these scriptures in prayer form, I have found that there are so many more opportunities to share the good news of Jesus than I ever would have imagined. So many more opportunities and, and things that I thought and places that I thought were not opportunities have become opportunities to share the good news of Jesus. Well, again, let me give you, I think, what are the most important takeaways out of these two verses. First is this, God is the Lord of the harvest. You know, often when we think about sharing the good news of Jesus with others, we're super concerned because we think it's all on us. We got to get it just right. We got to have just the right words. We got to make sure that we set the stage just right with that person. We put so much of the responsibility on ourselves. But in that, we deny that God is the Lord of the harvest. That God is the one who's been preparing the way and preparing the path. God is the one who's been preparing the harvest because the field belongs to Him and so does the harvest. So God is Lord of the harvest. So the Lord of the harvest knows the state of the harvest. So as we're called into the harvest fields, He knows that the harvest is plenty. You know, sometimes as I've looked around, I've deceived myself into believing that the harvest is not plenty. People just don't want to hear about Jesus. There's just so much set against the message of Jesus. And then there are those moments where I remember that God is for the message of Jesus. So really, who cares what's set against the message of Jesus? Why am I worried about what's set against the message of Jesus? Why do I not trust that God is going before us to prepare a way? But here's what we learn about a harvest is that a harvest requires harvesters. And so Jesus urged His disciples to pray this prayer 
that God would raise up and send out workers into the harvest field. I think we're at a moment in our time, in our culture, in our society, in this nation, in this world, where what we need is harvesters. We need harvesters who trust that God is doing His work and we're called to do ours. Then in Colossians 4, we see a a similar theme in many ways, that God is the one, again, who opens doors for His message. Again, who is doing the opening of doors? Is it me? Is it my clever words? Is it the fact that I'm so good at building friendships? Now, again, those are all important things. But ultimately, it's God who opens doors. And so Paul says, pray that that God would open doors for this message. Pray that God would do that. So then we can come in and do His work. But the second thing that we see in this as well is that Paul says, pray that we may be able to communicate it clearly or pray for Him, Paul was asking, that He might be able to communicate it clearly. The same prayer for us as well. God actually is the one who provides His people with the ability to communicate His message. So God gives both the opportunity and the ability when we choose to say yes to what He's asking of us. And in that, what we learn is this. We're simply asked to be faithful. You're not asked to be a scholar. Certainly some Bible knowledge helps. You're not asked to be the most eloquent person in this building, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. I'll not deny that some eloquence can help. You're not asked to be the cleverest. There's a whole lot of things you're not asked to be, but one thing you are asked to be is this. Faithful. When God calls, when God provides the opportunity, He also provides the ability will we be faithful in sharing His good news. And so what I've been doing, and this has created some interesting moments, and this is what I'm going to be asking you all to do as well. Our elders and staff have been doing this the last several months too. Is setting alarms on our cell phones, on our watches, that go off at specific times that remind us to pray these prayers. And so every weekday, my alarm goes off at 10.02 for Luke 10.2 and 4.24 to pray Colossians 4, 2 through 4. And I will tell you, it has created some interesting conversations as people will look at me and say, do you want to take that? Because they think it's a phone call because my cell phone is making a noise, right? And then I explain, this isn't a phone call. This is a reminder to pray a prayer that I pray daily. I'll just share with you one quick story out of that. Um, I I coach high school basketball just down the road at Covenant Christian Academy. So I'm there with my high school players. One day I decided I needed to go a little bit early to set up a few things, make sure that there were some drills to run. So I happened to be there at 424. And some of my high school players were already there. We were meeting at 5. Maybe they'd stayed over, but I don't know what the situation was, but they were there already. And so at 424, my alarm goes off. And one of the players says to me, Coach, do you need to take that? And I say, well, actually... This is a reminder for me to pray a very specific prayer at this point. And so I said, you guys want to pray this with me? And so we did. We prayed together Colossians 2, 4, 2, 2 through 4. And we asked that God would open doors for His message. We asked that God would give us the words to communicate that message clearly. And then we asked that we would clearly communicate it as we should, says Paul. And at the end of that prayer, one of those, one of my players said to me, Coach, that's so cool. I never knew that we could pray and actually ask God to help us in that. I've been wanting to and feeling like I should share my faith for a while, and I just didn't know that I could ask God for help in that. Now, that may seem as if it should be almost self evident that we could ask God for help to do the things He wants us to do, but sometimes we forget. That when God calls us to do something, we can ask Him. In fact, we're shown that we should ask Him for help to do it. And so beginning this Sunday, next Sunday, I'm going to challenge you to set an alarm for 10.02 and 4.24. And it's probably going to create some interesting moments. I don't want to label them as awkward because they shouldn't be awkward. 
but they should be interesting. As you find yourself in a place where maybe you are, your alarm goes off and you're in the middle of a conversation with someone. And you're called to pray a prayer in faithfulness that God would raise up workers to send to the harvest field, that God would open doors and that we would be able to clearly communicate his message. On the way out today, uh, you're going to be able to pick up a card. And I'm going to put this on the screen real quick so that you can see it. This is a prayer and fasting commitment card for the year 22 for the dates of January 9th through 29th. That's just ahead of us. And on this card, we have a number of things that we're asking you to consider. Now, this is not mandatory. Nobody has to do any of this. We're just asking you to consider this. And oftentimes we find if you will find if you got a piece of paper and you commit to doing something and you sign your name to it, you're more likely to follow through. This is just to be helpful. I find that that's true for me. And so on this, the first thing that we have is on here on here is for 21 days during the month of January, I commit to join the Grace Chapel community in praying Luke 10 and Colossians 4, 2 through 4 daily. So if you say, yes, I'm going to do this, and you could set your, al- your own alarm times if you want to to pray those prayers. It doesn't have to be 10.02 and 4.24. But if you do, it'll be neat to know that you're joining many others who are doing the same thing. So if you say yes to doing that, you can check that box. Then the reality is, as we talk through, there are plenty of benefits to fasting. And so you may have another reason for setting aside time to pursue God, to pray and fast, this coming month. And it could be a number of these things. It could be to repent from and be freed of sin. It could be to discover the Lord's will. It could be to mourn a loss or death. And all of these are reasons in Scripture that people set aside time to pray and fast. It could be to prepare for a specific ministry opportunity, or there's a line for other on there that you may fill in the blank. I know on my card, I had an other that I filled in there for myself. And then there are different types of fast that you could commit to. We talked through these last year, so I'll go through these very briefly right now. There's a selective fast where you choose to abstain from something specific. It could be social media, it could be television, it could be a specific type of food. And I will say this, most fasts in Scripture do involve abstaining from food. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't choose to abstain from something else. And so you might give up one of these things because, again, you're pursuing something else. There's the Daniel fast, which is a specific type of fast where you consume only fruits, vegetables, nuts, and water. A short interval fast where you might choose to give up one meal daily. There's a daylight fast where you might not eat any food during daylight hours. And then there are people, believe it or not, worldwide who are still fasting the complete fast which means no food during the duration of the fasting period, water only. I've mentioned before our brothers and sisters in Sierra Leone, they begin the year with a 30-day fast, and the vast majority of them choose this complete fast. Now, they've been fasting for years and have a rhythm and a habit of this, so they know what it feels like and the body is used to it. I would not suggest this if this is your first time fasting. I would suggest something more simple and maybe a combination of a few of these you could choose to do. You might choose on weekdays to do a specific type of fast and on weekends to do a different type of fast. You can mix and match. That's fine. Then this last piece, which is a little bit different from uh, from what we did last year, we're encouraging you to join with others as you fast this year. And so we're asking the question on there, with whom specifically will you journey through this fast? It's got a box on there for your small group. You may choose to walk alongside some members of your small group as you fast and pray together. You may have something specific you're praying for within your small group that is, uh, you know, could be one of these things or a specific ministry opportunity for your small group. The second box on there is your family. Parents, we would love for you to include your children in this in some way. We would love for this to be a meaningful time where you can sit down and discuss and converse every day. Rob, our discipleship minister, is creating a 21-day guide that will go along with this prayer and fasting time that will have specific prayer prompts for each day. If you are parents and you got young children, it would be great to sit down and work through those with your family daily. You may choose to do those by yourself. You may choose to do those with a small group, with others, maybe your family specifically. But We would love for this to be a time where people together can come and walk this There are some that are maybe looking at this saying, well, I don't know that I'd have anyone to journey with if I decided I wanted to do this in a group. 
And if you would like somebody to walk alongside of you for this fast, but you don't know, you're not in the small group, maybe you're here by yourself, uh, you, you can get one of these cards on the way out today. And if you want to, most of you will probably choose just to keep this card for yourself. We're not asking for these cards back from you. This is for you. But if you want to, you could hand this card back in, especially if you check that last box and your name is on there. We will know that you're looking for someone to journey with during this 21 days. And we will find ways to connect and pair you with others who are looking to journey with others uh, along this walk as well. If you don't want to hand this card back in, you could send an email to myself, paul at gracechapelchurch.com or rob at gracechapelchurch.com and we will make sure that you find others to walk this next 21 days with. We're hoping and praying that God will do uh, amazing things more than we could ask or imagine through this time. That too. Um, we're praying that God would open doors. We're praying that God would raise up new workers for the harvest fields. We're praying that God would show us that the harvest is truly plentiful if we will say yes to being faithful and become workers in the harvest field. Before we wrap up this morning, I do want to share with you real quickly, this is a video clip for those of you who maybe haven't done prayer and fasting before. This is a video clip from last year's uh, time of prayer and fasting at the end of the campaign. We collected a number of uh, quick video clips, testimonials uh, of folks saying this is what happened in this time of prayer and fasting last year. We're going to be looking to do that again this year. So if God is working on you, doing a work in you, starting to do a work through you, we love to know about that so we can share that with others and encourage them. So watch this video real quickly. I, th I think you'll be encouraged. <laughs> that has awakened me during this time of prayer and fast is my need to be still with God. Um, time to be alone with God, but to actually physically take my body and go into my closet, shut the door, which it tells us to do in Matthew 6, 6, and to be still. And that doesn't mean, and I am praying, I am talking to God, but then there's a certain amount of time where I have my mind as still as I can be, my mouth as still as it can be, and so that I have that time to listen to God. And in Psalms 46.10, he says, be still and know that I'm God. So I, it, it has to be an intentional thing. And I've been doing it um, actually since the beginning of January. And it becomes a time where um, it quiets my mind, it quiets my soul, and also it quiets my body. And it, it actually... Gives, end up, ends up giving me more energy and helping me to listen to God, listen to what He is saying and not just talking at Him. Here's what I learned during this time of prayer and fasting. Here's what God did in me during this time of prayer and fasting. And let me tell you, as a church leadership, We've been praying for a while that during this month, God will do more than all we can ask or imagine as we together as a church body say, here's where we're going because this is the direction God is going as well. So as we close this morning, I'm going to lead us in the Luke 10, 2 and Colossians 4, 24, or 4 2 through 4 prayers uh, together. And then we'll, uh, we'll sing together a song of encouragement as we close. Let's pray together. God, as we begin this year, it is my hope and prayer and my belief that you will reveal yourself as Lord of the harvest. As the one to whom the fields belong. And as the one to whom the harvest belongs. As the one to whom every person in this world belongs. God, I pray as well that you would reveal to us that the problem is not with the harvest, it's, it's with the workers at times. And so I pray that you will lighten us a fire to want to be first workers in your harvest fields, but then to pray to see others come to labor in your fields as well. God, I want to see in visible ways your promise 
come to fruition before us that the harvest is plenty. That there are many who want to know you and about you. Many whose lives you will transform as they come to know you. Many new disciples that you will raise up. Many who you'll turn into disciple makers who will go out and become workers in your fields all over again. So God, we pray Luke 10 too. We're asking you, Lord of the harvest, to raise up and send out workers into the harvest field. We pray that you'd begin with us. Then, Father, as we accept your call, as we pray this prayer, as we ask you to transform us through those words, we pray as well the Apostle Paul's words of Colossians 4, that, God, you would open doors And we believe in your promise from Revelation 7 that, God, you are the one who opens doors that no one can shut. So, God, I pray that you would open doors for your message. And I pray as those doors are opened, you would give us, your workers, your disciples who want to be disciple makers, that, God, that you would give us the words to clearly communicate the mystery of Jesus Christ, of His goodness, of His love for us. I pray that we would accept the call to be faithful. Just to go and communicate it as we should. And trust again, God, that you're doing your work. That you were doing your work way before we said yes to doing ours. So God, we want to see you as Lord of the harvest, the opener of doors, the one who even strengthens us and emboldens us and gives us what we need as we share with others. Again, God, we pray that you would do so much more than what we can ask or imagine this month, this year, as you open our eyes to the harvest fields before us as you open our eyes to open doors, as you renew us by these prayers we will pray, this time we spend in prayer and fasting, that God, you would see our pursuit of you, our choice, our desire to be faithful to you, and that you would reward that with much faithful, much fruitfulness in the year ahead. Help us to be faithful. Help us to trust that you are God. Father, truly transform us. Father, truly do so much more than what we could even imagine beyond our wildest imaginings. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. And together as a church, we say, Amen.